My name is Jennifer Gray Thompson, and I am the CEO of After the Fire. Welcome to the podcast, How to Disaster, Recover, Rebuild, and Reimagine. In this podcast, we bring you the very best practices, best hearts, and great ideas from other disaster-affected communities. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to season three of the How to Disaster podcast, where we help you recover, rebuild, and reimagine. During this season, we will be releasing Take Fives, shorter episodes that highlight some of our past guests speaking about similar issues, themes, topics. We wanted to do this so that perhaps it'd be easier if you only have a few minutes, but you wanted to connect with these focused episodes and guests that you could condense all their messages um, into one smaller bite-sized piece. One of the things that we know about disaster is that we really have to meet people where they're at. And sometimes where you're at is you only have five minutes. We're very excited for the third season. We've got great guests and wonderful information and content about how to actually help get your community through to the other side. So thank you for joining us. And if you wish to find out more, please visit our homepage at afterthefireusa.org. Consider giving us a like or follow if you like this podcast. We really appreciate it and thank you for your time. And then in October of 2017, we got punched straight in the face by not just a wildfire, but a veritable natural disaster. Diablo winds, hurricane winds came into our community, caught us on our heels, and it took us a long time to get back onto our toes. And once we did, once we organized community and did all these other things, we learned what the true power of resilience and embracing that portfolio is all about. And it's been far more learning than I've been teaching. And, uh, but, you know, I've been a lead nationally, National Association of Counties, a chair of resilient counties, testifying before Congress, lead the effort statewide. I'm the president of California counties this year and uh, created their resilient portfolio and work with the governor's office on getting money, resources, time, prioritization into these efforts. It's time not to just be, as we say, Sonoma strong after disaster or before a disaster be Sonoma ready, but be Sonoma safe. Uh, that was a perfect introduction, so thank you. It encapsulates um, so much of actually why I like working with you. And one of the things is about your approach to servant leadership, and it is a different approach. Can you talk to us about why that's so important, especially in the midst of a, of a natural disaster? Gosh, no. It's crazy because I've got the chills right now. It's like you're bringing me back to those moments. When you talked about that, the first thing that goes into my mind is, is that, you know, I'm in the public sector. I'm an elected official. I don't like to call myself a politician because some people think that's a bad word, right? But when things were going crazy in 2017 and before that, and what I've learned is diving deep into it, is, is that I have access and I need to give people that access. I don't need to hold that to myself right? Um, you and I know of a lot of people in my position and other positions like yourself, they go to briefings, they sit in big tents as disaster people run around and talk about high level things and show maps. Then they put out a little bit of communications, a press release to the community. And for me, it's been all about getting people what they want and what they ask for. So if they want to know where the fire is, I go out and I interview the fire captain and he get, I have him get out a map. And you know what? All of a sudden, instead of 200 people clicking on a, a link because it's like, oh, I want to see all of a sudden 50,000 people watch a video. And I'm like, wow. Okay, cool. Now I need to facilitate me to get out of the way of me to get all these other awesome people talking and help translate what they say as professionals into our community because our community wants to know what's going on. They want to know how to empower themselves. They want to know what they need to change. They have power. You just have to create some infrastructure underneath them. So servant leadership in my, in, in, in my mind is uh, part of it's leading by following, right? You, you, you have to keep your nose to the ground or as they say, you know, get the pulse of the community. And once you catch that, um, you have to start to feed that, right? And uh, if you help people rise up, the fascinating thing is they start to hold you even more accountable. And that's good because then they want more, right? They want more progress. That's what I want. 
So at about midnight, um, when I had got the evacuation order to evacuate my own home, um, our protocol in Malibu is if there's evacuation south of the 101, which was what was happening, then we act fully activate our EOC. And so we started to evacuate, uh, activate our EOC, and my staff uh, came in and started, um, you know, doing messaging and, and, and stepping everything up. Um, and at about 7 a.m. on Friday morning, uh, we got notice from the fire department that we needed to evacuate uh, the entire city of Malibu. And so what was happening was there was a wall of fire about 14 miles long headed toward the coast. And we were dealing with, you know, 70, 80 mile an hour winds. The fire front was actually, um, uh, they were holding the front in certain areas, but with the wind, the embers were driving those embers a, a, about two miles ahead of the front. And so that was where they really lost control. Um, unbeknownst to me at that time was that uh, the LA County who was started to leave Ventura County, it started in Ventura County and moved to LA County, you know, was begging for resources. And they kept putting in the mutual aid resource requests and not getting them. So they would be asking, you know, for 500 engines and getting 50. When we look at, um, at California, where we sit, and that, uh, especially as a representative of Napa County and agricultural region, um, diversity is part of our fabric. Um, but that diversity isn't just even race, right? When you look at, at a piece of paper and you look at your census demographics, uh, diversity is culture. And when we look at various cultures, um, it's important for us to understand that our communication has to be culturally competent in order to be well received. And I, I use the phrase cultural competence um, in, in my capacity as a supervisor with my staff and with EOCs especially to communicate that we need to move beyond accepting translation as sufficient. And cultural competency, um, really just to, to, to touch upon it, um, really stems um, from a place of equity in our communication and understanding that not every person is similarly situated to receive that same Nixle message, that same iPods message, uh, that same broadcast and radio message in the same exact way. Uh, words mean different things to different people and the medium of communication that we use likewise will determine who in fact will receive our messaging. And so it's really important for us when we look at disaster communication, redundancy is the word that we use, right? We want to make sure that a person not just receives a message once, we want them to receive it two, three times because that's how we know we are reaching people. But even if a message arrives at a person, that's the technological part, right? That's our communications. Those are our towers and infrastructure. That's the cellular data plans, the broadband that gets the message to the person. What happens when the message arrives at that person is what actually will impact whether someone is able to survive a disaster or not. And that's where equity comes into play. The way in which we communicate that message, its medium of delivery, um, the language that is used in that, in that message, that is where we can actually save lives. This podcast is sponsored by Fire Safe Signs. In a disaster, seconds matter. Fire Safe Signs give first responders critical information like can a fire truck make it down the driveway? What water sources are available? Fire safe signs help property owners provide crucial information to first responders, and they're made in the USA. Getting this information in seconds helps save lives. Together, we make our community safe. Visit us today at firesafesigns.com. You know, and you want to make sure to, and it's something we did after the Woolsey fire is really increase the number of people in our CERT team, the Community Emergency Response Team, because 
those people know their neighbors and they know their neighborhoods and they, you know, even with a small amount of training can be a huge resource to connect with people. Um, we unfortunately suffered um, flood after fire immediately post Woolsey and went through another round of about four evacuation series of evacuations. And so we used our CERT members to go door to door to make sure that their neighborhood and their neighbors knew there's a large rain event coming, be prepared, you know, keep your phone charged, ready, be ready to go, ready, set, go. Um, and they were wonderful because they know the people. So you're going to open the door to your neighbor where you may not to a stranger from the city coming by. Um, I wanted to also share the other um, thing that we have implemented, um, and it sounds very simple, and it actually is, um, but we were really worried that we would hit, get, a, get put in the exact same situation where we didn't have resources. Um, we had always assumed in evacuations, if power went out, that we would use sheriff deputies to drive through our neighborhoods to evacuate people. And because of the number of people being evacuated at the same time, you know, there just wasn't uh, there wasn't the ability to get that many uh, law enforcement officers in the neighborhoods at the same time. And so we purchased, the city purchased about 50 bullhorns and we made magnets for all of our city cars that say disaster response. And um, we've trained and we've done drills of this where I put two city staff people in a car, one's driving, one's using a bullhorn. They have a siren and a microphone and they drive through the neighborhoods and saying, time to evacuate, you know, and um, it actually works pretty well. Um, so we did it so we could see. And so it's just one more tool that we have. I hope I never have to do that. But, you know, if we get put in a situation where we don't have enough resources to do evacuations, my staff can actually step up and do it. Now, there's people in our emergency operations center who were worried about if they lost their home. They were, Karen Fees, our head of human services, fled her home and went to her office uh, and sat there and mobilized her team of, you know, 700 employees while her home burnt down, right? Uh, just so oh, I can still feel it. Um, so there's this crazy thing about not being able to be a professional, but being embedded into the, into the very storm that you're, uh, you know, that you're sailing through. And I think in a certain way is it makes you more human and it shows you really how much you can handle. Um, because everybody was personally invested. You know, you were running out into Sonoma Valley doing what I was doing and trying to hit everybody and everything and just get the sense of what was going on because a lot of people in those initial moments, they have that uh, deer in the headlights look and it's like the fog of war around the community. And it was just about being like, you okay? Do you need a connection to something? It was kind of, it started with just a soft understanding. And then there's this point where certain folks just dive in. And, uh, you know, you've talked about this a little bit. Uh, you said diving into the wreck. You know, one thing that I always say is, is that, you know, um, hell hath no fury like trying to really uh, make progress in imperfect systems. You know, you try and stick your head into a problem and all the people who have talked about the problem for years want to attack you for having the audacity to not talk to them first about what they've learned. And then the other ones want to critique you while you're going through it to say what you're doing isn't good enough but you just get busy and you start to build momentum. I say the hardest thing in this world is to create momentum out of thin air. And then the only thing harder than the hardest thing is to try and recreate lost momentum because there's a lack of belief that it worked the first time. You know, I, I think, you know, when you, when you look at what your, your role is um, after uh, we all, as we're moving with adrenaline through a disaster, and I'm going to say, a, you know, a, a, a short-lived disaster, like a fire, an earthquake, a flood, um, you're moving through it and, and you get to that point where you say, okay, it's over. Um, but what I would say to any elected official um, is, no, your work has just begun. Um, the, the, the work that comes from disaster recovery is an incredible lift. Um, one that each time I, um, I, I, I must say is, um, is over, it can be overwhelming. Um, but as with any situation in life, um, someone always has it harder than you. And I think that that's um, what has really helped me understand our partners in the region 
of rebuild uh, with Lake and Mendocino. And knowing um, that, you know, at the time when we went, more than half of Lake County had burned. Um, and I, I remember thinking about that and thinking half of their county has burned. More than half of their population has relocated. And there was one moment where they had $48,000 in the bank as a county. And, and, and they could not afford to purchase a plane ticket for a supervisor to go. And, and, and thinking, putting my mind around that, that's a harder situation for them than anything I've ever had to face here in Napa County. I have a gift and that is I am from Napa County. And when I say I am from Napa County, it opens doors. I don't ever need to explain where I'm from. Everyone in DC knows where I'm from. And I can share that gift, that blessing with Mendocino and Lake County. And for us, it's important when we are looking at advocacy, we need to not look at it in an insular way. We need to understand that if someone from Lake County is displaced, they are likely going to a surrounding county. And so we are all interconnected. If I don't help Lake County and Mendocino County and Sonoma County for that matter, fix and help them through their recovery and their advocacy, their problem becomes my problem. Thank you for joining us on the podcast, How to Disaster. For more information, please visit our website at afterthefireusa.org. And if you liked this video, please hit subscribe. Fannie Mae provides mortgage options for you and your family. If you have a mortgage owned by Fannie Mae, you may have financial options available after a disaster, such as forbearance plans, deferral of payments, lending assistance, and counseling. Find out more from our Disaster Response Network. Go online at www.knowyouroptions.com relief or call 1-877-833-1746.